Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Sumner Sambo. More than 81 million Americans voted last November to install Joe Biden as president. But the fate of the Biden presidency could come down to a pair of runoff U.S. Senate elections happening in the state of Georgia. The runoff votes will decide the balance of power in the U.S. Senate. The runoff races are being held in accordance with state election laws because no candidate in either race won 50% of the vote in the November elections. Both the Republicans and Democrats are looking to turn out supporters to vote. For the Republicans, getting out voters is crucial, and they're looking to the stronghold of North Georgia, as well as rural areas and smaller towns. And for the Democrats, it is even more crucial, as no Democrat has won the Senate race in 20 years. It's important for my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. It's important for them because things change so fast and things have changed so unpredictable. It's not even funny. So what may be today may not be tomorrow. And the leaders that we will choose today is going to make that change for us. It's going to make our change for our grandchildren and for our great-grandchildren. We have so much to worry about. The stimulus check is not enough. The ones that's unemployed, we're still struggling out here trying to make the ends meet. And it's, it's, it's not a joke. It's very serious. So our kids are not fully, fully in school like they're supposed to be. And people don't have jobs. So it makes a difference. It makes a difference. So, yes, the corona is taking over where we should have the government taking over instead. And why does winning the Senate matter for the Democrats? Let's speak to Bill Bernard, the spokesman of the Democrats abroad, UK, and he joins us via Cisco WebEx. Good to have you, Bernard. Uh, what's at stake here at the Georgia polls, and uh, how will this shape uh, the Biden presidency? Well, basically what is at stake is control of the Senate. Uh, if the Democrats win the two positions, the two Senate races, then they will have 50 votes in the Senate. The Republicans will have... 50, it'll be a tie, and the vice president can then make uh, the, the deciding vote, cast the deciding vote. Um, in many cases, in policy terms, it may not make all that much difference in that there are a number of moderate Democrats uh, who are more than likely going to vote in a certain way that won't be changed significantly by who controls the procedure. But the real power rests in the chairmanship of the committees. Uh, and if the Democrats tie and the vice president can make the uh, casting vote, uh, then they will gain control of the committee structures. And that is the important uh, element, the important lever that can be used to push through Biden's, uh, Biden's program. He'll have a much easier way of getting in, uh, getting his bills considered in the Senate. I mean, the, the Democrats have controlled the House over the last four years, and they've passed multiple pieces of of legislation through the House, and they died in the Senate because Mitch McConnell simply did not permit those pieces of legislation to be considered, to be wrought up for a vote. That wouldn't happen if the Democrats uh, have a tie and the vice president can make the casting vote. Now, let's take a look at what uh, Joe Biden said when he went to that rally in Georgia, and I mean, he was very emphatic in saying that unlike any time in my career, one state that is emphasizing again that one state can charge the cost, not just for the four years, but for the next generation. You are a Democrat. What uh, does Biden actually mean by that, especially the emphasis on generation? For the next four years, it can make an incredible difference. I think what he's really talking about, though, is that if the Democrats gain, gain control of the Senate, then he has a real possibility of trying to bring some degree of civility back to American politics, some degree of willingness to compromise, to work across uh, party lines, to get major legislation passed. One of the unfortunate consequences of the last 30 years has been increasingly the votes in the Senate in particular are hardline partisan. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons we've had so few measures of any consequence get through. And it's been a largely dysfunctional government, in part because it's been divided government. So that's one of the reasons why I think um, Biden thinks that he can make a generational change, that he can return American politics to a level of civility and a level of pragmatic, principled compromise uh, that is uh, in, imperative for a democratic society to function successfully. And now uh, uh, to Mr. President right now, President Trump, 
he was actually saying that uh, this is the last line of defense against your party, the Democrats, and he's uh, asking Americans to ensure that, uh, you know, they use this opportunity to save the America that um, we love, in quotes, like what he said. <laughs> How much of a hit have you been uh, given to uh, President Trump, and wh what's the likelihood that uh, Georgia will go for Democrats? I think it's going to be an extraordinarily close election. It will, in large measure, turn out, uh, turn, depend upon turnout. Uh, which side is going to have its voters more enthusiastic in turning out? The Republicans are plagued by some dissension within the Republican Party itself in Georgia, tension between the president and the secretary of state, that notorious phone call that was made yesterday where the president for one hour tried to bully the secretary of state of Georgia into finding 12,000 votes or so. Um, so there's dissension within the Republican Party between the president, the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the secretary of state, all of whom uh, are Republicans and all of whom think Joe Biden won Georgia, all of whom defend the integrity of the Georgia election process in November, but all of whom also favor the, the Republican candidates for the Senate. So it's an extraordinary situation within the Republican Party in Georgia. Uh, and it, it, that may have an impact upon the turnout, particularly in North Georgia, which tend to vote Republican. On the other hand, the Democrats are encouraged by the early voting, the heavy early voting. Three million people have already cast votes in Fulton County, which is mainly Atlanta, uh, something like 75% of the same number who voted in the, um, in the November election have already voted. So the turnout seems to be pretty high and pretty heavy there. There's also been a strong effort among the Democrats to register young people who weren't eligible to vote, who weren't 18 in November, but who have turned 18. Whether or not that's going to be successful, we don't know. But the race is so close that any one of those factors could uh, could make a difference. And I would want to actually get your personal opinion on Mr. Trump's uh, uh, earlier decision to call Raffens Beggar and uh, you know seeking uh, for that 12,000 votes illegally. What, how much damage has that done to the American presidency, the American democracy, and how do you think the rest of the world should be viewing America at this point? It was totally inappropriate, if not bordering upon the illegal. Uh, it, it really seems something you might encounter in a banana republic. Uh, the incumbent uh, office holder calling to try to find votes that don't exist uh, in an election that has been fair and has been counted now for three times in Georgia with the same result every time. I think one of the things that we should be heartened by is the degree to which the American system has withstood uh, Trump's efforts. Um, on the other hand, I think we should worry because it has withstood it largely because of a handful of principled Republican state officials and some Democratic officials, depending upon where, which state they were in. I mean, the Secretary of State, if we'd had a different kind of Secretary of State in uh, Georgia, a Republican who was more pliable uh, to the president's wishes. If we had had different people in control in the process in, in um, uh, Pennsylvania, for example, uh, that might have a, 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 an outcome that is fundamentally opposite to the will of the American people. It's a threat to our fundamental democracy. And I think that's one of the reasons that it's so, so frightening uh, to, to many of us uh, for the future of our, of our nation and our democratic society. Now, Georgia's black population is more than double the national proportion. Do you uh, see this black population actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, influencing the outcome of these two senatorial elections? And um, do you think your party has campaigned enough to the black population to deserve their votes? Well, of course, one of the bedrock uh, elements of the Democratic coalition is the black population, especially in urban areas. Um, it, it's not, it's not, um, uh, it is varied. They're, they're not every black can be counted upon to vote Repub uh, Democratic, but the overwhelming majority, something approaching 80, 85, and sometimes even 90 percent, do. Um, partly because of the, of the history of the nation and the way politics has developed since the 1960s, uh, and partly because the measures that Democrats favor tend to uh, benefit those who are, have the short end of the stick in life, who have uh, perhaps not done as well as perhaps uh, others might have and who need a hand up, though not a help out. Not a, a help out. Uh, the, the turnout in Fulton, Georgia, and Atlanta was certainly uh, important to the Democrats coming as close as they did and important to Biden's win, as was the turnout in Savannah on the coast, which is also a heavily black area. On the other hand, uh, the Democrats also made significant 
inroads in the Atlanta suburbs, the, the white areas of Atlanta, uh, and whether or not uh, Ossoff and Warnock can make up the deficit they faced uh, in November, the uh, 2% that they were written behind roughly, uh, the uh, Republican candidates will depend in large measure, not only upon the level of the turnout in the black community, but also in the degree to which those suburban voters, those suburban white voters, uh, stick to the decision to vote Democratic. Now, considering that um, the Democrats have never won any senatorial seat for the past 20 years in Georgia, uh, aren't you having goose pimples that you may actually lose out of this election? Well, Georgia has been going through a process of change, just as a number of southern states have. I mean, if you look back over the last 20 years at Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia, uh, Virginia, which used to be a red state and then a swing state, has become increasingly blue and increasingly can be counted upon to go Democratic. Uh, North Carolina has followed a somewhat different route. It uh, seemed to be moving in the same direction that uh, uh, Virginia was, though in recent times it's been closer. Democrats have won gubernatorial races there. They won this past November and four years ago. Um, and the Senate races have been relatively close, but nonetheless, Republicans have uh, been d reasonably dominant. Uh, Georgia is sort of up for grabs, grabs in the process of change. Georgia has grown enormously. Atlanta has become a, a magnet for population moves south and for corporate moves south. Uh, and it, is, it has a more diverse population today. Not only is, does it have a significant black population, but it has an increasingly large uh, Hispanic population, particularly in Atlanta, and increasingly a, a fair number of Asian Americans uh, live in the Atlanta area and in its suburbs. So it's become a more diverse electorate. It's become a more, it's a younger electorate. Uh, and all of those things tend to, Democrat, to benefit the Democrats. And it's one of the reasons that Georgia is, is truly up for grabs, in a sense, uh, between the two parties, in a way that it was not 20, 22 years ago. Let's talk about your candidates in the election. Uh, how much of campaigns have they done? And then uh, uh, have they also, uh, you know, diffused the tension that's ongoing about uh, how this election may actually impact on the national uh, uh, on national legislation and all of that i missed the first part of that question yeah Sorry. I'm, I'm talking about your candidates in the in, in in this georgia senatorial elections how much of campaigns have they done uh, to the electorate to convince them that georgia actually has a crucial role to play for example in the biden presidency and they need to know what's at stake to ensure that uh, after giving Biden their vote in the presidential election, they will actually give him more push to ensure that he gets good uh, legislation uh, coming out of, uh, you know, the Congress when eventually he becomes president on the 20th. You know, a, a lot of people are happy with divided government, with the presidency being in the hands of one party and one house or the other or both houses being in the hands of the other party. And so a lot of people are content and happy and generally people who don't want to see any change, who don't want to see fundamental legislation passed, they're happy with that situation. It, it benefits them, at least as they view it. But many Americans, I think, have seen that at least over the last 30 years, a divided government has basically increasingly meant dysfunctional government. Uh, and it has prevented us from dealing with some of the real problems that we face. So it may be, that, especially again in the suburban areas of, of Atlanta and in the urban areas of Atlanta, uh, there may be those who for reasons of not having divided government, having unified government that can move and make progress on our on the challenges that we face, it may be that those voters, the hope of the Democrats is that those voters will in fact turn out and they will make the difference and that they will then uh, permit um, uh, Biden's program to be cons given fair consideration. Now, I think it's fair to say that neither of the two candidates in Georgia uh, is from the far left of the party. They're, they're, they're center left, moderate left, all um, right, but I, I, I'm afraid we just have to go at this point in time. It's really been nice uh, <laughs> talking with you, and I've really learned so much, especially from the aspect that you talked about, that uh, Georgia is in the process of change. I mean, let's hope that that change will eventually turn out for good to you Democrats. Thanks so much for joining us. You're still watching the Arise interview, plenty more still ahead, including Georgia runoff, high stakes to decide control of U.S. Senate. A special correspondent breaks down the figures. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. Voters in Georgia head to the polls Tuesday to decide a pair of Senate runoffs that will determine whether Democrats or Republicans control the chamber in Washington. The race is Pete Republican Senator David Perdue against Democrat John Ossoff and 
Senator Kelly Loeffler, another Republican incumbent against Democrat Raphael Warnock. It comes a day ahead of a joint session of Congress to certify the Electoral College votes and cement President-elect Joe Biden's victory. An Arise special correspondent, Carl Bostic, joins me now in the studio for an in-depth analysis. Good to have you, Carl. Why is this election so special two months after the presidential election, and what's at stake? Well, that's right, uh, Sumner. It's two months after the general election where we saw uh, Joe Biden upset uh, President uh, Trump. Joe Biden is now president-elect. And now we have the most consequential election following that because control of the Senate hangs in the balance. And with the control of the Senate, uh, really, it affects just how easily and how much Joe Biden can accomplish. If we just take a look at some of uh, uh, the slides that we can show you, we can just look at what's, what's at stake here. We want to, first of all, talk about these four candidates right now. If we have that... Uh, slide to show no, you. Well, well, it's still if, coming if you, up. If you, Just go ahead. Okay, so if, you, if we see that first slide there, I believe oh, okay. we do yeah, now. Yeah, it's ready Okay, right so what now. we see, no, we should be seeing the four, we should be seeing the four candidates right now. We should be looking at, um, we should be looking at um, yes, I think David Perdue, uh, Kelly Loeffler on the Republican side, uh, John Ossoff and Warnock on the Democrat side. Your guest alluded to some of these changes right now. The short story is this, Sumner. Uh, uh, Georgia is in incredible dynamic change right now. It's been traditionally a red state. It's been traditionally Republican. And now people are saying, is it now turning purple? And by that they're saying, here, here no, presidential, no Democrat had won the presidential uh, uh, nomination from Georgia since 1992 with Bill Clinton. And here is jo here's Donald Trump uh, being defeated in Georgia. So the question becomes, was this an aberration or not? Or is there real seismic change? And if you look at the coalition that put um, uh, Joe Biden ahead, a coalition, as your guest alluded to, to a younger diversified audience, you know, more blacks voting, uh, a younger population, better co college educated, um, and also the minorities such as Hispanics and Asian Americans, that's the coalition that gave him a very narrow two-tenths of a percent over Trump, you know, 12,000 12, votes. That's what he's trying to cobble together now. But, but if we go back to that slide again, if we could, about, of the four candidates, I want to make some other points, if I may, about, uh, about the four candidates, if, yes, we, if we, we have we it. Do have it now. Okay, what you want to keep in mind is this, um, uh, Sumner, is that right now a lot of records are being broken. Already three million people have already uh, voted. That's probably three-quarters of who, will t who turn out to vote. Most of those three-quarters of early those voting, early voting. Uh, th those are mostly Democrats. So really, this is what, why it's D-Day, because as a rule, traditionally, it's uh, white Republicans who turn out to vote. Uh, whites are about 80% Republican. So they, right now, they have a real serious cushion right now, the Democrats, uh, 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 Ossoff and Warnock. But, that, but if there's a downside, the downside is, historically, there hasn't been a Democratic senator in about 20 years. There's never been a black senator ever. So in, if you just look at history alone, history is still on the side of Purdue and Loeffler. Yeah, yeah, very quickly, just to comment there. If you actually look at the figures that came out of that uh, first election before this runoff, you'll see that uh, Purdue actually got 49.7%. Right. And I'm wondering... Uh, <laughs> Mr. Warnock got uh, 32, and then uh, Loeffler 25 for 9 percent. In this election now, don't you think that Republicans have more advantage than the Democrats? Uh, yes and no. The short story is because they're so divided right now. Uh, they're divided because uh, with, with President Trump's mixed messaging about how it's a legal election and how it was rigged and stolen, you know, it's a, it's a matter of whether or not uh, those Republicans that do vote, you know, will it be because of enthusiasm for Trump or they may be ambivalent and stay home? That's, that's the big question mark. But let's look at what's at stake. If we can look at the next, next slide of the numbers, why this is so important for Joe Biden is a really, really big deal. For example, if we look at the next set of numbers that we can show you right now, we can see why the Senate is hanging in the balance right now. What we can show right now, the Senate, the state of play is, is 51 Republicans, 48 Democrats. So <clears throat> the Democrats need to pick up two seats. If they pick up those two seats, and Kelly Loeffler is still a sitting uh, Republican, she loses her seat, then it becomes a 50-50 tie, Sumner, a 50-50 tie. That's actually good news for Democrats. Why? Let's look at the next set of numbers. We've got some more numbers to show you, if we may. So the and next and that would leave the, the Vice President Kamala Harris being the icebreaker. Exactly. Kamala Harris is the Vice President, and she would cast a deciding vote for anything. But to give you an idea of just how close this is, Sumner, let's look at the latest polls, because there's no real national polls out there on Georgia, because polls are right now quite controversial. But we have seen two sets of polls right now just to show how much of a cliffhanger this is. If we look at these two polls right now, one is from an actually a Georgia uh, Republican polling uh, 
organization that shows uh, John Ossoff, the Democrat, ahead by one point, uh, Raphael Warnock ahead of Kelly Loeffler by one point. Uh, similarly, the 538 National Polling Group has also up ahead of by about uh, uh, just under two points, about uh, 1.4 and Warnock under, uh, again, under two points. The point being is this, Sumner, both of those numbers are well within the margin of error. <coughs> and uh, if you were to ask, well, what does this mean in terms of, you know, results and things like that, if it's anything, you know, at like five tenths of a percent of the margin, it's an automatic recount. So it's, it's really, really going to be a very, very long night. Now, what, um, uh, how long should we be expecting uh, results? And uh, wouldn't it be like uh, it happened during the presidential election where the votes would have to be counted over and over again, just like it happened? Well, in November, for example, for Georgia, it took almost a week, week and a half before we knew that Biden uh, uh, was declared the winner over Donald Trump. So similarly, uh, I wouldn't hold my breath until tomorrow morning. Uh, this could go into uh, uh, the next few days, if not next week. And uh, again, a lot of it hinges on turnout. And one of the aspects of turnout I want, I want to focus on right now, Sumner, is just the, the black turnout. If we can just show you some information about how important the black vote is, how much has changed uh, since November, if we can. We've, we've got some, some, some information to show you, share with you there. For example, in the case of uh, Raphael Warnock, who's a reverend, no black Democrat has ever been elected to the U.S. Senate from the South. Only six African Americans have ever been elected to the Senate. Only two black people have been elected governors of the nation city. So that's, that's the, the national fabric of race and politics that we have to keep in mind. That's in the back of people's minds when they elect uh, a black, not only uh, on a statewide level, but to a national office, that is U.S. Senator, because that's always hanging over everything, especially from the deep south. That's why this is such a big challenge here. But there's also some good news as well as far as Democrats are concerned. Let's look at some more information, if we can, about what's going on right now in Georgia, which is really quite fascinating, if you will. <clears throat> what we can see is that for this runoff election, Blacks are actually turning out in greater numbers than they did in the general election uh, for, the pres for the presidency. That's really kind of amazing right there. <laughs> it's meant to actually cement Joe Biden's uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, presidency. And, and also, Stacey Abrams, let's go back to that slide again if we could, because that's really important. Those numbers are very, very critical. If we can go back to those numbers. 114,000 new voters who did not vote in November, Sumner, they've turned out to vote for this Senate runoff. And most of those are people of color. 40% are black. So this is really good news for the Democrats. But at the same time, the Democrats, they're very, very careful because they just, they just don't want to really uh, be too optimistic because history is not on their side. There hasn't very been well. a Democrat senator in 20 years, and, there hasn't, and uh, there's never been a black senator before. They need to win two seats. But um, uh, while we have time, I just want to show you quickly uh, two campaign ads just to show you how racialized this has become, I mean, how divided and polarized. This is an attack ad. The first one is an attack ad that Kelly Loeffler ran about uh, Raphael Warnock. If we have uh, this ad, if we can play this up for you. Raphael Warnock puts on a good act, but listen to his then wife on official police body cam footage after Warnock was accused of running over her foot with his car. I've tried to keep the way that he acts under wraps for a long time, and today he crossed the line. So that is what is going on here, and he's a great actor. He is phenomenal at putting on a really good show. This is how Raphael Warnock treated his own family. Imagine what he'd do to Georgia. That's, that's very and, impressive. And, but but you, you missed the last part of the commercial. It says that's how he treats his family. Actually, they already divorced, and they were in a child custody dispute. Uh, and, and, and the commercial ends, if this is how he treats his family, how would he treat Georgia? But now let's look at the next commercial that Raphael Warnock's people put out. It's an interesting campaign commercial. If we can show you that campaign ad right okay. now. and play. We told them the smear ads were coming, and that's exactly what happened. You would think that Kelly Leffler might have something good to say about herself if she really wants to represent Georgia. Instead, she's trying to scare people by taking things I've said out of context from over 25 years of being a pastor. But I think Georgians will see her ads for what they are. Don't you? I'm Raphael Warnock, and we approve this message. So something I want to quickly point out, you know, not only is he a pastor, but he's a, he's a pastor really of the spiritual home of black America. You, you remember Dr. Martin Luther King. Well, he was the pastor of the Ebenezer uh, Baptist, Baptist Church. Church. 
Well, that's Reverend Mordock. He's the pastor of that church. So, you know, he really speaks with a lot of authority and such. And of course, he speaks out controversy because he speaks about racial injustices. Uh, similarly, because it's the Deep South, uh, because he's running against a white candidate who happens to be a woman, they're very, very careful to show that uh, he doesn't meet that quote unquote stereotype of an angry, angry black man or an angry black man uh, taking on a white woman. Those, those are like third rail. Those, those are like little you know, sh you know, shock waves that kind of make people nervous and unsettled. So here you have him, actually, people actually made fun of him, walking a dog, walking a yeah, beagle. I mean, some, <laughs> some people say that's what white people do. White yeah, people yeah, walk yeah, dogs, yeah, walk beagles. But he looks, he looks harmless there. Uh, he looks someone comfort that you're comfortable with, and he's walking his beagle. It's friendly, and he's just saying she's taken out of context. So he's not that angry black man. Well, we do not have enough time. Um, I've just been told very quickly um, we have to go pretty soon. But just before we go, what do you make of uh, uh, Trump's uh, uh, you know, decision to actually call Raffensperger I ask him for those 2,000 votes in 30 seconds? Well, very simply, he's desperate. And uh, time is running out. Tomorrow's when it's certified. And uh, you know, but the thing about it is Georgia alone won't get it. He, he needs to get uh, more than uh, uh, 36 votes. Georgia will only give him 16 uh, votes. All right. I, I'm afraid we just have to go right now. Well, that's it for this edition of the Arise interview. I've had Carl Bostic, Arise Special Correspondent, here with me. Thanks so much. Do join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Goodbye and thank you for watching.